everybody, welcome. Um, good morning, good afternoon for some of you, good evening for others of you. Um, we have many on with us right now. I think several more will be joining shortly, um, but welcome everyone to the International Humanistic Management Association Necessary Conversation. Today we're here with Otto Scharmer of MIT and the Presencing Institute, and the talk will be on leading toward well-being. Um, this and other necessary conversations are sponsored by the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility at UMass Lowell. Um, so we're very grateful for that sponsorship. We're even more grateful to all of you uh, for coming today and for coming regularly. I know many of your faces are so familiar. Uh, great to see all of you. Uh, we do have a number of events coming up uh, through the EMA website. You can check those out. And you'll see in the chat for in the chat box, I've put a brief welcome. Um, it's also letting you know that uh, we're recording this call today, so the audio will be available to you. There are a few websites you can go check out, including Otto's website and the Presencing Institute website, um, as well as the EMA website. So welcome. Um, just a quick uh, little primer and something to look forward to in December. Our next necessary conversation is with Gretchen Schweitzer. Um, so tune in for that one. That's December 3rd. It's a different time and day. It's Monday and it's at uh, 11 a.m. So keep that on your calendar. Other events as well to look forward to. Um, have I covered everything? I think so. Michael, may I turn it over to you to introduce uh, Ema briefly? Sure. Well, thank you, Erica, uh, and thank you, Otto, for doing this with us, and thank you for everybody uh, for your interest in joining. Um, the International Humanistic Management Association is a group that is trying to uh, promote better organizing, and we leave it at that high level because we think that we need to organize better to just ensure survival <laughs> uh, at this point, but also in potentially with the ambition to ensure a world in which we can all thrive. And I think the talk that Otto is going to share with us today is very much in line with that, with leading towards well-being. How can we sort of shift the various mindsets that are underlying our current practices, daily practices, but also managerial practices, organizational practices, societal practices that we might need to adjust in different ways. At, the, at EMA, we call it two principles, for the protection of dignity and the promotion of well-being that signify this potential shift transformation towards better organizing. And we're trying to reach out to a number of audiences, including academic audiences, practitioner audiences, and, and the policy audience. So anybody that's interested, please check us out. This is one format that we're doing. We're doing a couple of others. So thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Yes, again, thank you. Um, I'm not sure that I mentioned that we will moderate Q&A through the chat. So if and as you have questions or comments you'd like to discuss um, after Otto's uh, uh, initial conversation, please do put those in the chat and we'll moderate from there. So again, welcome everyone. Welcome Otto, what a privilege and a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, just uh, briefly, and again, it's too brief, uh, but I can't do justice to Otto anyway, uh, but Otto is the senior lecturer at MIT and founding chair of the Presencing Institute. He chairs the MIT Ideas Program for Cross-Sector Innovation that helps leaders from business, government, civil society, um, to innovate at the level of the whole system. Um, Otto has written several books, many of them best-selling, Theory U and Presence, as well as Leading from the Emerging Future, um, and most recently, The Essentials of Theory U. Um, he's co-founded the MIT XU Lab, and I hope I'm saying that properly, but Otto can correct me if not, has received many awards prizes, distinctions, um, and again, we're so pleased to have you join us today in this necessary conversation. Otto, welcome. Thank you, Erica, and uh, thank you, um, uh, Michael, for um, uh, inviting me uh, uh, to this series here. So let me quickly check whether I can uh, work the um, technology here to screen share. All right, is that visible? Yes, it is, thank you. So uh, what I, um, uh, and it, uh, so uh, I'm really um, happy to be, um, uh, to, uh, be part of this group because I wanted to uh, connect it to the uh, uh, network and association um, for a while. 
and I'm happy to uh, um, uh, make a start this way. And um, I think, Erica, you sent out like an, an article, which is uh, so a little blog uh, entry from last week, which was is, is maybe one background for our discussion. And um, uh, I will make a few more remarks, um, maybe that can just throw out a few more pointers for uh, jump off points for our discussion. Great. And um, uh, what interests me, and I think that's probably a connection point among many of us, is um, that I have been always interested in how is it possible that we can turn the classroom into a place where students uh, participate in not only um, making the world a better place and making themselves a better place, but also in the practical methods and skills for local global movement building and building kind of the capacity and the connections that it really requires to, to have an impact in the world. So that's, um, and I will uh, you know, share a few experiences outside and also inside the classroom that maybe jump, uh, you know, can kickstart our uh, conversation. Um, so uh, this here is, um, <clears throat> of course, something you have seen many times, the iceberg model. And what drew me here to, to MIT is really the systems thinking uh, approach. And uh, so which starts with the distinction between symptoms and root issues. And then you see the evolution of systems thinking by kind of differentiating uh, the what is below the waterline from structures to mental models or thoughts kind of to deeper sources. Uh, and instead of deeper sources, we could also say um, uh, awareness or consciousness. So um, what I will be presenting, uh, I would refer to as awareness-based systems change. And um, one way of summarizing that is, uh, would be with the following three sentences. You cannot understand a system unless you change it. Of course, kind of that was the reason why I came here from Europe, basically, to learn how to do that um, some uh, two decades ago. Then number two, the, the one sentence um, summary you could say from um, uh, theory U, which is, um, you cannot change a system unless you transform consciousness. And then uh, number three, the big question, of course, how do you really do that, the transformation of consciousness? So if that matters, how do you really do that? You cannot transform consciousness unless you make a system see and sense itself. So I would say that systems thinking, the essence of systems thinking based interventions in real world change always has been um, making a system see itself. But from a theory U perspective, we would kind of qualify that even a little more. And we would say, unless you make a system sense and see itself. So it's not good enough to just see, make the system see itself because then we are just stuck in the head and suffering the knowing doing gap. So to really uh, unblock that, uh, we need to connect to the heart and we need to connect to the heart of the collective and how to really develop methods and tools for that has been the central avenue of my own inquiry. What are the symptoms? So what, you know, one way of um, how I like to, you know, differentiate them is uh, along these three divides, ecological divide, social divide, spiritual divide, which, um, of course, if you want, you can, could map along the 17 SDGs uh, as it is uh, suggested here by our colleagues from um, Indonesia uh, recently. Um, what's the problem today, uh, the challenge? Uh, it's basically, we live in a world of disruption and that's kind of the, the number one challenge in this century, probably individually, as teams, as organizations, as societies. What does disruption mean? It means like the future here on the right hand side is going to be different from the past. Which then, and presencing or theory U takes a perspective. So how do we move from here to there? How do we move from the current to the emerging future? Uh, and the perspective that uh, presencing would take on that question is that it's not only an outer journey that takes us, for example, to the edges of the system, but it's also an inner journey that um, requires us to um, 
connect with the deeper sources of uh, knowing. So disruption happens, uh, we know that, but um, what are the responses we see in society? We see three responses, right? The first one is downloading, same old, same old, basically the, an extension of the sta status quo. The second one is much more radical. It's um, turning backwards, kind of, kind of reorienting, uh, turning back to the past, basically, in order to make dot, dot, dot great again. And um, the third one is kind of leaning forward, leaning uh, into what is wanting to emerge. So we know this operating system well, ignorance, hate, fear, AKA free, it's a freeze reaction, freezing or closing the mind, the heart, the will. Or when we begin to lean into the future, kind of to, uh, opening the mind, the heart, the will. So, what are the uh, five behaviors that we see worldwide playing out? Kind of, you could call it Trumpism or some other ways, but it's basically blinding, which is not seeing, desensing, which is not sensing, absencing, so which is losing the connection to your highest possible future, blaming others, and destruction or self destruction. Uh, I don't need to go through all these numbers, of course. Um, we have seen that often enough. But um, what I would like to say is that, in my view, kind of this phenomenon, the upper phenomenon, Trumpism, um, is the result of two factors. One is disruption, and the other one is a lack of a capacity to connect with these three things on the lower half here the open mind, the open heart, the open will. Why do we have in society institutions of education? Uh, to develop these things. To develop the capacity when disruption happens to access the open mind, access the open heart, access curiosity, compassion, and courage. And if we ha have not developed that, when disruption happens, it's throwing us into this upper space. Uh, whether we intentionally want that or not. So that would be, you know, you could see Trumpism as a massive educational failure. So the three words today um, for our current condition, post-truth, post-democracy, the post-truth is, you know, stuck in our filter bubbles, echo chambers, post-democracy, our society is being ripped apart, as we know, and the post-human, that would be a whole other talk, but um, we don't have the time for that now. So where do we see the seeds of the future now? Uh, in creating infrastructures on a society level on three different levels, learning infrastructures, democratic infrastructures, and new economic infrastructures. So basically, whole systems learning, right? Whole person, whole systems learning, integrating head, heart, and hand. New democratic infrastructures, making them more democracy, more direct, distributed, more dialogic. Conversations that make us, um, that make the system see itself. And then um, new economic infrastructures, particularly kind of around collaboration uh, and applying systems thinking on an industry or on a whole system level. Um, so what are um, examples, if we just kind of dip, double click now on the new economic infrastructures, kind of that's kind of the, the topic, ego to eco, what does that really mean? Um, I think it means two things for us, uh, you know, uh, and also working with younger people. It's really two main capacities. The first one is understanding the bigger system. And of course, more than half of all our problems come from outdated economic theories, right? So we need to rethink the essence of economic theory based on the externalities that we face today. So the seven acupuncture points where we see capitalism um, as we know it transform as we speak are conversations that are already going on and most of you are probably very well familiar with. So I'm just going here on a headline level, nothing in detail. From linear to a circular economy, that's the whole nature piece. As I go through this, I'm really going through an economic production function, right? Nature is first. 
then labor, of course, from jobs to entrepreneurship. UBI kind of as one of the key concepts here. Capital kind of from extractive to intentional capital. Um, that would be a whole other talk. Uh, technology kind of from addictive to more enabling or co-creative technologies. Uh, management from hierarchical to more ecosystem leadership. Uh, consumption from GDP to GNH or well-being, and then coordination governance from hierarchy and competition to awareness-based collective engine, uh, action, which means really applying systems thinking on an ecosystem level. Um, so the macro piece, kind of rethinking economic theory or the key categories of economic thought from a uh, uh, you know, from an ecosystem awareness, kind of shifting these categories that are in traditional economic theory framed from an ecosystem awareness, uh, reframing them from an ecosystem awareness. I think that's job number one. And job number two is a social technology because what we really need is, and in all practical work, what we need to do is basically the same thing, which is, that in my experience, regardless of whether you work with governments, companies, NGOs, it's all the same. The key leadership challenges that leadership teams face cannot be solved by any single organization or sector alone. To address these issues requires us um, um, to develop approaches that bring in together stakeholders that jointly go through a journey where they shift their silo perspective more to a systems view, or to use a different word, where they shift their ecosystem awareness more to an ecosystem view. So I'm an action researcher here at MIT, and I have explored that question over the past 20 years, mostly with practical experiments. And, um, you know, occasionally writing an article or a book, but you know, most of my time gets burned through practical experimentation and what I learned through these uh, practical experiments is basically uh, uh, three things so what does it take to uh, um, you know uh, uh, to, to shift the mindset or to kind of to address to innovate in the face of disruption you could say well the first thing what it takes is is a process right so you can't just bring people together you need it takes a journey a, a process that moves people out of this, what you see on the uh, top left, downloading old patterns, and into the observe, observe, really connecting to the system from the edges, connecting to the deeper sources of knowing, and then uh, the learning by doing the prototyping, kind of applying design thinking and other related principles. So you need a process that is going through these three stages one way or another. That's the first learning. And the second one is, you need some inner leadership work that essentially is cultivating these three capacities, open mind, open heart, open will. And what I mean with open mind is the capacity to suspend old habits of thought. In other words, to see with fresh eyes. What I mean with open heart is to look at a problem through the eyes of your stakeholders. So from, through the eyes of another, not just from your own perspective. And what I mean with open will is letting go and letting come. So, and the third learning is that why is this so difficult? Because when, in my experience, kind of when you put yourself on this journey, kind of from your old patterns towards kind of connecting to your deeper sources of knowing, um, it is often difficult to progress, particularly if you do it in a social context, because um, we are confronted the moment you, you, you take the first step on that journey, we are confronted with three enemies or as i would say as a as a you know european kind of three inner sources of resistance which is voice of judgment voice of cynicism and voice of fear which are basically blocking the opening of the mind of the heart uh, uh, of the will so what does that look like when you kind of try to apply that in practice you go basically through the stages I uh, just described, but in the beginning, kind of there's a little bit more bringing the right kind of stakeholders together. Then you have kind of all these 
in their specific system, kind of sensing activities, deep sense making, and then the prototyping, the learning by doing, and then kind of uh, capturing uh, what has been the harvesting kind of uh, 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 and capturing the results from that. Um, what is the main thing that really happens? Yes, there's outcome and impact and these things, but the main thing that really happens is that all these stakeholders kind of that make up the larger system begin to change the way they communicate across institutional boundaries from a mindset that looks at reality like this, which is, you could say, more like an ego perspective, seeing reality out there, to this, which is, uh, seeing the system in a way that includes yourself, seeing yourself through the eyes of another. And when we go through this shift from here to here on the level of the individual, that's what we call awareness or mindfulness. And when we do that on the level of a group in communication uh, from here to here, we call that a shift from debate to dialogue. So dialogue is not people talking to each other. Dialogue is really making a system see itself. Where does that, and that's, as I said before, that was kind of my third principle, that's really where, when I work with practical systems, where the added value comes in. That's where the consciousness of a group is shifting. When you make a system sense and see itself. What are practical methods of doing that? So this is kind of one thing you see, it's called like 3D mapping, you map the current system, and then you um, look at it through a structured process of questions and you get all the different voices out and then you change it towards the emerging future. Here, this was kind of the, uh, all the business unit leaders from the Alibaba group. So like a bunch of different companies that work as an ecosystem, uh, 30, 40 people in the room. So we have like just um, a different bunch of tables. This is in Brazil. 150 people in the room, so we have more tables and then make people share across tables. So you begin to see the shared patterns across tables. This is a different method that's, um, that we develop at the Presencing Institute, which may be really the most important contribution we have made for um, the um, social change, um, which is called social presencing theater, because it's, um, very effective in mapping multi-stakeholder meetings and then making a system sense it see itself and you know making visible structural violence kind of and the, the less visible dimension of systems change and the blockages and making that visible to the entire system so it so it's like a blending uh, probably some of you uh, know the constellation work so it uh, uh, uses elements of that, elements of social science theater, and elements of, of mindfulness and embodied knowing. Um, so this guy here is a banker from Indonesia. They are mapping one of the biggest multi-stakeholder processes. But the role he plays is Mother Earth, right? So the three divides are always represented in these gatherings by bringing in the, the voice of nature, the voice of the future, and the voice of the excluded groups. Um, this is using the same method uh, at Lakeside University, founded by Jack Ma, kind of with um, entrepreneur owners, um, uh, owner and you know, owner CEOs um, of uh, Chinese companies a few weeks ago. So you can use these methodologies so where the, each company was represented with their top three people and then they make each participate in each other's cases, kind of do multi-stakeholder mapping there. Um, and Financial, the biggest fintech company in the world, um, who, by the way, succeeded in uh, making 220 million Chinese customers participate in reforestation activities through Endforest, the app. Um, doing, so how, in this case, this is kind of the third method here, which is simply learning journeys, sensing journeys. So they, the team, the top 30 people of their company spent like a week basically in a very detailed way understanding and feeling and interviewing the entire business ecosystem that they have in two different countries in, in, in Southeast Asia, Philippines and Indonesia. And then they came together. So three days for that, and then two days um, synthesizing that in um, Singapore, 
and based so so it is embodied knowing so they felt what all the stakeholders of the business ecosystem in these countries feel like and understood their perspectives and then from that um, uh, sensing activity they moved into having a very different conversation with each other about where they wanted to take their globalization strategy so last point here is um, how does systems thinking really apply to the evolution of systems and what i would see is basically the same um, structure of uh, evolution of systems change uh, across all major systems that uh, i have been working with and it's moving through the following three stages kind of from input and authority centric so like in healthcare and learning traditional teacher or doctor centric systems that's the past present is this output and efficiency centric so evidence-based medicine or uh, teaching for testing right aka bulimia learning fast in fast out which of course is the opposite of real learning which gets us to um, um, the good hospital and the good school, right? Learner centric and patient centric. Is that the future? I don't think so. I think the future is yet something uh, different. Um, in health, it is not patient centric medicine, but it is strengthening the sources of well being and health. So, uh, moving away from, you know, reacting to the health issue symptoms to really uh, strengthening the deeper sources. And in learning, of course, it is kind of activating a more whole person, whole systems approach to learning, integrating head, heart, and hand. Farm and food, same thing, traditional farmer-centric, industrial agriculture, the mother of half of all our ecological problems. Organic agriculture, that's a step forward. It's reducing negative footprint. Yet, it's not the future because in the future, it's really about increasing the positive footprint in terms of healing planet and people finance you can do the same thing traditional wall street impact investing right which is nice but not really addressing the deeper systems issues which would be yet something else and the evolution of corporate responsibility same thing alleviating projects corporate practices business innovation now say i have a electric car and all these nice things, but does that address the real root issues of sustainable mobility? Not at all. So it's, uh, that's yet kind of something uh, different that needs to be um, uh, developed. How does that relate to the classroom? So the traditional uh, approach was, well, transformative learning experiences you can only do in small groups. And um, that's also what I thought. And then three years ago here at MIT, I got the possibility to move my class, which is called ULAB here at Sloan, to, um, to this platform, which resulted in a user group of now 120,000 participants. Well, all of them, of course, are active, so don't get the wrong uh, impression. But it is like they have formed communities in places around the world, kind of significantly. We have more than 1,200 on our website, but many hundreds that are still active. So it really activated a global innovation ecosystem, right, of communities that have a, um, a life uh, way beyond the end of the course. And um, so that really, this phenomenon, kind of activating this kind of ecosystem that was already dormant there before, really brought up this idea of, uh, that I uh, you know, suggested at the end of the, uh, the paper that was sent around, uh, the, the little blog, um, to, um, to, of the Society Transformation Lab, which is, really the idea to create like a prototyping infrastructure. So it's a, it's, it's a point, it's a part two from ULAB. ULAB is really for individuals connecting to your deeper source of knowing. The society transformation lab is really for teams moving your idea into action and real world impact. And we are now addressing some of the key challenges and we are now uh, um, talking with a whole bunch of partners, including the UN, Teach for All, Ashoka, and so on and so forth, uh, to really bring together a, a broad uh, coalition of um, 
organizations and networks that work together around this key issue, basically uh, implementing the sustainable development goals at scale um, by, uh, and then creating a parallel track at universities kind of, uh, that help uh, students to participate, to connect to these initiatives and to participate and um, uh, you know, uh, learn how to engage with the um, new methods and tools of uh, movement building, which are in part digital and in part related to really offline um, social technologies like deep listening kind of in circle work where we can um, activate the more deeper human dimension that is uh, required um, uh, in change. So that's basically, that's uh, like a, a big picture uh, fly over here. So let me stop this and um, move from here into the um, conversation. Sorry, it was probably a little bit much, but, a little, but um, that's a little bit, um, I guess, coming back to my original question, how to turn the classroom into a place that allows students to participate and shape global movement building that's um, where I think um, we, we have a real opportunity today with the new social technologies and the way we can connect with each other that I would love to explore and where this kind of societal transformation lab is just one of the avenues that could be used to make that more practical. Great, thank you so much. We have a number of questions that have come up. Actually one, I, I, it's actually Michael's question, but it builds off of your, your um, most recent view of your website, which is the challenge of today is how do you do it more rapidly? How do we accelerate this? Can we start with that question? Do you have any ideas about that? How do we, how do we make what more rapidly? So this process that, um, that you have experience with that clearly you've seen success in is happening and there are invitations to participate, but how do we do it more? How do we do it faster? How do we guarantee that the momentum that is building is um, heading in the direction that you, for instance, have envisioned or experienced through the work you've done with others through your research? Well, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure I'm holding the answer to that, but uh, I think uh, maybe I have a point of view, and that is to, to go fast and to speed up, you need to slow down first. There's no other way. So uh, all this talk about speeding up, I, I don't, I think it's just adding to the noise. And um, uh, if you want to build a movement, you need to go deep in a small place first. I mean, that's what we have been doing for many years. So, um, so people think that um, you, you put something like ULAB online, it has a big resonance and they think it's about the digital stuff. It's not true. It's about all the offline stuff you have done before. It's about these deep, small um, networks. I think the, the, um, most people misunderstand what the power of digital is because you on, when you only think it about in terms of digital, the key really is linking the online with the offline. So the key to movement building and to speed and to massive impact is offline stuff, kind of having circle work, having personal practices, kind of having sm small circle work, having really uh, deep listening practices uh, and be really rigorous about that. Um, and um, also giving people permission to really focus on that and tune out from the noise, basically. That's what practices, whether it's individual or face-to-face -face is. That's my point of view, and that's what where we try to, um, to, to contribute. Erica? Please. Uh, there, there's another uh, question in terms of uh, the scale, <laughs> uh, and in some way, the example of the Italian MS5, uh, uh, is it MS5? Is it uh, the, the Cinque Stelle? Um, and that they are sort of adopting, according to the question, some of these ideas that you're presenting. Um, and, and the question is more like, how can it, these ideas be implemented at scale uh, without falling into the populism trap uh, that, that uh, the questioner is, is seeing? Yeah, that's... Um 
So I'm not um, exactly aware of uh, what in um, uh, Italy uh, the, the questioner is uh, re referring to, it, but that's a good question. And that's why I have um, in this uh, paper that was sent around, there's really the distinction uh, between 20th century political discourse, left and right, and it's an issue between ideologies, and 21st century political discourse, which is um, discourse between uh, open and closed. And it's kind of uh, a distinction, um, uh, you know, on off level of consciousness, right? So it's, it's really like an axial shift. And uh, I would say, um, the, the answer to the issue that you um, articulated, Michael, is um, uh, that we needed, so it's really kind of the, the opening of the mind, the heart, the will. That means, uh, you know, really to reaching out to the other ecosystems rather than closing down and creating architectures of separations and, and uh, uh, us versus them. Now, sometimes uh, it can be, uh, so, so that's, um, it, I believe in any of these issues there. So if you uh, deal with the complex systems of our time and with the reality of uh, really interdependence, it means that if you address these, uh, any of these issues more on a root issue, you need to connect to many other players. And that only can be done effectively if you go through this opening process. Um, and that's uh, where uh, I think um, the leverage point is the capacity of doing it. It's not on the level of ideology that we are, would not be agreeing doing it. It, it. It's a question of capacity. And that's why I think um, our community here has such, um, can, has such a critical role in that story. So there's a question about uh, appreciative inquiry as an approach in contrast to or in relationship to the systems approach. And that's also tied to the question of um, whether you're seeing more receptivity to this in other cultures, other than perhaps American culture or Western culture. It looks like there's, there's quite a bit of traction um, with Asian com companies that you've worked with. Can you comment both on the appreciative inquiry distinction and also where you feel like this has had the most traction? Yeah, so uh, I would say, so um, there is um, a whole a group of methodologies, and I would all refer to them all, including, of course, uh, AI, as awareness-based social technologies, right? So, so it's, they are all kind of based on the same fundamental assumption, sort of the ones that I um, uh, uh, suggested. Um, you could, you know, frame them a little bit different, but you know, it, 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 it's kind of a similar set of assumptions. And um, they all belong. That's why I, I use this uh, awareness-based social technologies or kind of awareness-based systems change, because it, it, it is intentionally not called like you process there. It's not like that specific methodology, but it's more like an umbrella term that would be inclusive of many other methodologies that share the same basic principles. And the way, um, um, the way then, for example, the U process is being used uh, is as a meta framework because it allows you to bring in uh, AI, uh, AI, for example, is particularly useful when you go down on the left hand side of the U. Kind of, there's kind of many great methods and tools you can use there. Maybe on the right hand side of the U, a little less developed, right? Kind of that's where you want to um, strengthen that with some other approaches. And so it allows you to kind of, um, combine the best of these methodologies. And like you, I mean, I'm like, with one part of my life, I'm like um, um, uh, maybe a framework builder, a social technologist, kind of who is, you know, uh, developing social technologies, awareness-based social technologies. But, you know, with much of my life, I'm also just a user, right? So I, I, I am working in, in the classroom and client situations and systems interventions. And as a user, um, we all have the same problem. We need to combine all these different methodologies and uh, bring them together in a way that is uh, that makes sense. So in that regard, that's a very familiar uh, uh, situation. And um, 
um, I think uh, in the field, many practitioners already integrate all these tools um, in the way indicated. Then, um, what was the other question? Um, just the traction as far traction. as cultures. Yeah. So traction, um, yeah. So for example, when I present that in China, I would emphasize um, a little more. I, I get like, uh, so when I, when I present that in China, a reaction I often get is, what? Um, who are you? So this is, so you're like American, a German American coming here telling us this, this is our stuff. This is not your stuff. This is not Western science. This is our stuff, right? So what, what you're talking about. So there's like, a, so that's a reaction I often get, right? And that has led me to say, yeah, yeah. So to say, yeah, you already know, right? So, you know, maybe, through cultural revolution and other disruptions kind of uh, it. So I, I basically, I'm going there uh, as a Westerner and giving them permission to reconnect with their own best sources of their uh, traditional culture. And of course, over the years, you learn to bring in some of these elements a little more, right? Kind of how does the essence of Buddhism, of Confucianism, of Taoism really relate to that? And that's, so I would bring that out a little more, right? Kind of in the later stages of a process, when you more come to the bottom of the U, more to the uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, dimension. And like in Indonesia, the, the, the biggest Muslim country on earth, then they say, well, this is kind of the essence of, you know, uh, of, of, of our religion. So, so that kind of the open mind, open heart, open will, and, you know, and then they exemplify that in different versions, even though that may not be the orthodoxy, right? Kind of that is uh, uh, maybe more dominant. But at least in Indonesia, kind of, I have got uh, similar reactions there. I would say, um, so for Asian, um, in India, I have just uh, personally less experience, you know, but that just from individual encounters, I'm going less uh, regularly there. But of course, I mean, India is sees itself as the mother of all religions, anyhow. So everything comes from there at the end. So uh, yeah, so so there is um, uh, also deep connections there, uh, with the particularly on the realm of my, the distinction between small as self, capital as self, right? Small as self, my current ego, and capital as self, my highest future possibility. So I wouldn't spell that out usually, but. I mean, everyone, you know, who knows a little bit of kind of the, the, the context um, you know, know, knows that this is, has been a major theme kind of, uh, you know, also in uh, the um, uh, Hindu and the Indian kind of spiritual tradition. So, yeah. Um, so when you say Western religions and Eastern religions or wisdom traditions, clearly there is, uh, you know, on the Eastern side, there are many connections. But I always... Um, so for me, it's, it's never about religion, or I, I, I don't even emphasize that, um, since mostly, like the rest of us, we, we work with diverse groups of people. So my, um, my goal is actually to giving a terminology and methods and tools that allows people to pay attention to the deeper level of their experience, right? Kind of particularly on the third and fourth level of the you, so the more subtle aspects of our experience and to not buy into religious dogma, but, you know, really being more precise and connecting with your own experience, which is really what, what science is about, right? So, 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 so I'm more kind of interested at, at that uh, interface, letting the data talk to you, let your experience talk to you mm -hmm. and uh, be, become more a black belt in how we, observe how we listen how we connect how we um, you know when we engage with a situation really connect not only on the level of the mind but also on the other levels of knowing that's really what um, is practical value because when you deal with disruption that's the kind of knowing that really is um, is then more relevant for you um, so coming back to your question so where does it resonate most uh, the user, if you just go by numbers, um, so that we have like three clear biggest uh, user numbers, which is North America is one, Europe, uh, the other one, and then uh, China, uh, East Asia. Uh, that's, that's the third one. Those are the three main clusters. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, so I'd like to invite Sandra Waddock had posted a question. Sandra, you can unmute yourself if you would. I think, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Great, please go ahead. Um, so I, I'd always, hi everyone. Um, I'd always wondering um, if you could, ex I know this is about supposed to be about education and I'm really curious about how to implement it, particularly in like undergraduate or even graduate um, business education. But my question, was originally was about, could you share with us some examples of what changed after you make these interventions and how the groups that you've intervened with sort of maintain this new sense of awareness that they've gained during these experiences? Thanks. Okay, so, so to both parts. Well, to some degree, I mean, often we don't really know. I mean, and we have seen like a whole spectrum. So if you, um, the reality is if you move to MOOC-based structures, massive open uh, uh, courses or learning infrastructures, the first thing you need to get uh, used to is kind of you totally give up any kind of control. People do whatever they want with your stuff. And um, so it's, it's really all over the place. And I'm not saying it's all great, right? So it's, it's, it's all over the place. And um, we have, uh, for, from those who participated the, uh, in the ULAB, the first years, kind of we did assessments there, and it was usually like 30 to 33% who said, who talked about life changing. So, I mean, something um, experiences, and then, you know, like another group of that size, kind of with eye opening. So, so for a number, a number of people, something significant happened. And if you double click on that and say, where did that happen and why? There's usually, most of that I would say is related to either small circle work. So we really give them kind of quality processes for small circle work where they really build the container because nobody shifts consciousness by watching any video nonsense, right? So by, by you know, being just an observer, you need to be in a deep listening space in order to really uh, go through uh, a deeper transformative process. And we basically, you could, you could think about it as a radical decentralization of the classroom, right? What, what the MOOC is, if it really works. You hand over all your tools and you make them create these holding spaces for each other. And that's like uh, in these um, circle work, but also in hubs kind of where they come together in place-based communities. So that's uh, one thing um, that we learned. And there... Um, but then there are others, like many people kind of, they start something and then they can continue. So there was just a connection, it's incomplete. As I said, it's, it's really all over. Um, in principle, so when we looked at that, so I'm coming, of, uh, uh, I, I'm coming from that, and I'm also asking myself, so what is my role in this here? So there's already like enough personal change in the world. I don't need to contribute to that. So it's like well covered. There's enough systems change in the world that doesn't get, get gets enough um, uh, traction. I think where I try to come in is really where that blends, right? Kind of the um, the personal and the consciousness perspective, kind of to the system, and that's where that's why when we then looked at what comes out of ULAP, um, there's often um, sometimes the aspirations go full through, and there's really you know. Um, amazing impact that you see even years after right so that's also interesting these groups keep meeting and you know prototyping initiatives take off long after the end of the class so there's something kind of really long-term working there but often um, if I look at it more from a critical perspective I would say it stays also often in the personal space and it's not always really um, transforming the system Right. So, and that's really the starting point where we thought by listening to these experiences, then people have all these aspirations, but they are not materialized. ULAB is over and now what? Um, so that's where um, we, um, uh, why we developed the societal uh, transformation lab to really focus more on teams and on the system's impact. So it's like a companion. It's a, it's a part two of this process just to nudge people more to the systems change, because that's what we try to be in service of. We, we don't want to be just another uh, infrastructure that is uh, primarily and only working on, on the personal and uh, person-to-person -person, uh, space. 
So, so that's one answer. And but maybe the other one, uh, Sandra, that I want to, uh, I mean, it's like an insight we really had in running these experiments. So, where does the change happen? It's personal. It's the it's kind of the um, the circle work, the the hubs, the the, the place based groups, and the other piece that they always reported on is we have these live sessions where people come together. So we broadcast that here from next door. Um, uh, so from a, a out of MIT, it's a one hour broadcast and we invite people in to join that as a global community in the same hour. And interestingly, even though the technology we use, everything we use is not really the way you want it in terms of interactivity. There is something happening there because we use mindfulness practices as part of the group. We really, so what, so again, my third principle, make the system sense it see itself. We design these global sessions to do that, to make this, the community sense and see itself. And one aspect of that is using, um, you know, you know, uh, a, a global mindfulness moment that, that connects you, your attention to your own body and then to the larger community that you are part of, to the planet and stuff like that. So it's just a few minutes, but we heard that kind of, so people say, I realized that I'm not just the odd person in my own community. I am part of a larger movement and that allows me to wake up to my real aspirations to, and also to have more courage to activate my local stakeholders and my local ecosystem of change makers around that. So it's like an interesting thing that the, the global community becomes a container that helps me to connect with my more personal, deeper intention and actually make it happen in my own context. So that's a real interesting discovery because when you say, well, who's the teacher there? It's not the guy who's talking from MIT. It's not necessarily another person in my local context, but it's the global community. So it's kind of the global field of connections that people feel and that gives them the confidence to connect more deeply with their deeper aspirations. And I think that because that is so much missing today, um, I, I just think it's interesting because I think it's a space where we could do a lot more as a global community of educators. Thank you. You may have actually just answered this question and I want to acknowledge there are so many wonderful questions in the chat and we will capture the chat and that will also be available to everyone as well. Um, but there was just a question um, about peace and how does uh, theory you relate to the broader concept of peace? Can you comment on that? That's a great question particularly because I hardly ever get that. So um, I need, first need to write down the question because <laughs> that's more interesting than the answer. So um, peace is more than the absence of war, right? So, there's, um, so, so positive peace is more than the absence of war. And what it really is, I believe, is the... Um, so my... Um, thesis advisor uh, was the, um, the peace researcher, Johan Galtung. So the, um, the guy who uh, invented the theory of structural violence. What is structural violence? You have victims, but not, uh, direct, it's not a person. The perpetrator is not a person, but it's an economic structure, for example. So, um, and um, I think positive peace is uh, essentially about uh, reducing structural violence, transforming economic structures, uh, and to some degree even maybe uh, advancing also political or democratic structures in a way that uh, generates more well-being for all, kind of, which is basically the, the, the topic of a network or, or of our community. And... Um, so if you think about a positive piece, it has everything to do with what we try to make happen uh, in this community. Um, and uh, when you um, look at the absence of peace today, it is uh, you know, in part through direct violence, of course, that, that needs to be addressed. And there is, I mean, this whole, another area that I find very interesting but know very little about is that trauma. Right. So, and, but I know that there is a, a number of people who use 
theory related concepts around trauma because trauma is basically a freeze reaction uh, towards uh, something uh, towards an injury and then the healing is basically uh, creating a container right so it's when you think about it in terms of the you process it's all about so when you deal with um, uh, uh, historical trauma when you deal with structural violence um, I remember so as a German being in Namibia to, uh, you know near one the first workshop was one of the sites where the first um, Holocaust uh, in the 20th century uh, was uh, committed so when you go through these um, when you deal with these um, historical traumas uh, and um, uh, uh, deal with groups kind of where, where these things uh, have happened or are present, then um, the key is to, to create the container, right? To create a healing container um, uh, in a really skillful way. So in other words, it's not speeding up the process, but you need to slow down the process so that kind of uh, some of that can come back to the surface and can be reintegrated in, in, in the larger system. So um, personally, I'm not that much directly involved um, uh, in, in this kind of work as of yet, uh, but um, I have been told by um, a number of colleagues that there, there is a very significant relationship and I think it's a very um, interesting area to explore more to. And whoever, uh, I mean, asked the question, I would be, Maybe after the session, I would. Uh, if, if you are more connected to that or have practical experience, I, I would love to uh, stay in exchange around that and to learn from uh, whatever the experiences are. Great. So I think you will end up with a follow up with Tillman Bauer on that Great. one. Thanks, Tillman. Um, just one more question because we we only have really a couple minutes left. Um, but the one that I just saw come across the chat is about uh, the issue or challenge of incumbent power and what you do with that, uh, either from a positive perspective or uh, you know, as more of an obstacle in affecting change. Yeah, it's interesting, right? So it's, um, we all remember how Hitler came to power through elections and um, not through uh, actually um, direct vote, right? Kind of not, not through, um, um, it was through, uh, you know, uh, elections and coalition building. So we see democracy um, in danger today and on the defense uh, because, I mean, uh, our country here is the best uh, example Be from within, not from outside. And that in a way, so, th so the enemy is within, so the enemy is like, uh, so we are armed to the teeth as a country, right? for against you know all these exter external threats and forces with a, a massive military but where does the real threat come from it's coming from within i think that's a like um you remember kind of so the um, the, the, the 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 presencing move kind of from bending so what is what is it i think leadership today um you can reframe, so in this century, the most scarce resource is uh, attention, right? So what do we do as leaders? We are shaping fields of attention. So what do you really do as a leader? Kind of you shape the fields of collective attention one way or another. And um, so um, when, we, um, uh, uh, when, when, when we do that as a leader, it's not only what we focus on, but it's also kind of um, bending the beam of collective attention back onto yourself, right? So it's kind of this, remember kind of the, the telescope moving out and then kind of the telescope uh, bending and uh, pointing back on the observer. That's really, that's the shift in consciousness and what it means as a leader and uh, you know, in any kind of system today or as a systems thinker is um, creating infrastructures that help us to, uh, see ourselves in the mirror, right? And the mirror of reality. And seeing ourselves kind of in the mirror of reality is bending the beam of observation back onto ourselves. So that's, um, uh, uh, that's uh, I think kind of this uh, incumbent uh, uh, power is really, um, 
is calling for distributed leadership, for resilience, kind of this kind of calling from a bottom up. Yes, that is, uh, that's this, our story. That's the last thousand years of history in the West. What's the headline? Bottom up. That's who we are. And um, so in, in that way, kind of the Trump challenge is a wake up call that we need to reconnect with, with this source. So it's not the end of this journey. It's just kind of a, a wake up call to reconnect with that. And you see, you can, you know, America today uh, is it's uh, when you look at the public conversation and what's happening kind of maybe or what happened until last week or something top down is a little bit depressing uh, and all these things, but it's also um, bringing a new movement from the bottom up that starts in cities and companies and towns and on a state level. And it's kind of um, re-energizing kind of this because uh, that kind of problem um, will not be solved by any single person. It's something we need to do together. And it's something that in most cases starts locally and, and not on the national or global level. So it's a, it's a microcosm of uh, uh, where uh, we are at. And uh, it's a movement that's already in many places but mostly local and mostly not aggregating to a national or international level. And that's why this uh, infrastructure societal transformation lab, or that's also where I think kind of education, the educational sector and the, the university of the 21st century can hopefully play a helpful role. Somebody has to play that role. There's no other institution in society better positioned to do that. But of course, are we living up to that? Very little, right? Do we have the, the capability? Absolutely. But um, it, it will require a new, new, new form of alliances. And that's where we all need to just uh, keep trying. And that's basically the intention of the um, Societal Transformation Lab. Otto, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for helping us all move closer to that potential. Um, I think I speak for everyone here. What, what an incredible conversation we've had for you today, with you today. Um, and I know Otto's um, happy to follow up with, Absolutely. with people as well. So thank you, everyone. Uh, please join us for our next Necessary Conversation and other EMA events. Um, Otto, again, so many thanks. What a privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thanks to everyone, and uh, let's stay in touch. Uh, uh, hope, uh, please uh, distribute my email so that we can have follow-up conversations. We thank will you. do so. The audio will be available to all the video. So, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful right. day. Nice to see you all. Otto, thanks. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Super.